what advice would you give to like freight brokers that are looking for business? Um, like if they were to reach out to you, like what would stick out? What would make you want to work with them? Give them a shot. Being caught up on my inbox, so I actually see it is one part. But <laughs> no, I, I do think like it's a tough question. Some of it is like so much of, of any of this stuff is like you're in the right place at the right time. Sure. I would say like the one thing that will stick out to me is what's going on guys welcome to another episode of the daily freight caviar podcast today's guest is mark mckenna head of transportation at viho Mark, what's going on? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy, happy to be doing it. Yeah, this is fun. It, it took a while because uh, we were supposed to record back in May, and then your we wife were... had had a kid, or I mean, I guess you we, had a, right. Oh, no, uh, yeah, the, she <laughs> she decided she didn't want to wait till her due date, so it, it kind of threw a wrench in the plans a little bit. But yeah. uh, everybody's everybody's healthy. Everybody's good. Awesome. Um, glad we could catch up finally. Definitely. And we're in August now. Today is August 17th. We're in Chicago at the Chicago Podcast Studio. Shout out to Chicago Podcast Studio, uh, Mark. So. You're at Viho. I mean, give us some background about yourself. Uh, like, are you are you from Chicago? So, grew up in the uh, northwest suburbs. Went to University of Illinois. Kind of stayed around here for you know forever. Yeah. Um, from U of I, though, like moved to Chicago, 2011, uh, with my now wife. Uh, you know, that then girlfriend. We've been been here ever since. So, sure. um, kind of. Uh, I, I think we're we're pretty bolted down here in, in Chicago. Not planning on going anywhere. I mean, Chicago's great. I, I don't. Not shocked by that. I love Chicago. Uh, funny thing is, we both went to U of I, different years. Just um, miss each other. Yeah. yeah, just miss each other. And you studied creative writing at U of I uh, before starting a career in logistics. Why? Why did you choose creative writing? And can you tell us about some of the the writing that you've done? That's a good question. I um, I, I wanted to do many different things, like at school, just trying to figure it out. Honestly, like came to a point where. I had always enjoyed writing, and so I thought, "Hey, why not? Let's get let's give it a shot here." Um, it was it was cool. I, I I what I would say is what I what I left there with. I got more far more into music and and poetry and that side of things in my okay. in my younger years here here in Chicago, um, and like still like to dabble from time to time. But I've definitely like not exercised that muscle in very very long. So whenever yeah. I whenever I try to, it, it's it's not like it used to be. I'll just put it that way. Sure. But. I feel like a lot of people don't associate like being creative. With logistics but there is like a component of being creative in logistics that people don't really appreciate or, or look at because I've, I've people like to call it being shady sometimes in logistics I like to call it being creative <laughs> I get that I, I think even on top of that the one like correlation you can draw is you know you're you're in a English or creative writing class and like you're reading a piece and then you have this full discussion of like what was the intent here what what did this person mean by this and yeah. you like try to look at every angle right sure. um i think that like that's the mindset you need for yeah. for logistics right you gotta find a you gotta be able to look at every possible solution that you could get to get totally. to the best or maybe the least worst theory right depending on the situation um and that is like absolutely in my opinion like a, a creative mindset that you need to have yeah it, it's very important and i i've seen that like the most successful people in logistics are the ones that are very creative when it comes to providing solutions for customers and well, so you you, gr you graduated from U of I in 2011 uh, or 2010, 2010 and, 20, yeah. and it's just an awful job market. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get into logistics? Uh, that was very much like a stumbled into situation. So it was, you know, I, I definitely didn't have anything lined up. I didn't have it all together at that point. So it was working out jobs for the time being. Um, got my first, you know, office job and then was promptly laid off because that company went under. It was you know, just during that time. Um, and wound up working for Packard in, the, in their leasing arm in, in Chicagoland. Um, and for those who don't know, Packard is a manufacturer of Peterbilt and Kenworth. So it was my first, uh, like first foray into logistics, but with the physical truck side of things, working the the rental counter, uh, mm -hmm. the rental counter over there. Um, and I don't know, it just kind of stuck from there. Um, from there, it was onto brokerage life, which you know anyone that we're ever talking to in these situations they all, they all have their brokerage years totally right? yeah i definitely want to hear more about the brokerage years i got a lot large audience from the brokerage years if you could maybe tell us uh what what were your like i don't know a couple years in the 3pl world like yeah so that was a 
that was still a bit of a not culture shock, but it, it's just such a fundamentally different environment and and type of job than anything else out there, right? Obviously, I'm like I'm exposed to these carriers in Chicagoland when I'm at when I'm at Packard, but to be on the on the brokerage side and like really get a clear understanding of how the industry works, not just sort of the kind of anecdotal things that like people people I was working with prior would, would tell me about like the the clients that they had, yeah, uh, was pretty eye opening. Okay. Um, you know, in typical broker fashion, like I wore a lot of hats. I did the carrier sales thing for a very short amount of time, but sales is just not really my thing. Um, and then, you know, like spend some time even doing like dispatch, which frankly, I really enjoyed. Um, you, you know, you, of course, you get like the angry, the real angry drivers at yeah. times and everything. But like it is cool to be able to like connect with people in that way and help them through stuff. Sure. Um, ultimately, like really kind of settled in on like the strategic sourcing arm and the customer operations arm. So somewhat of of inside sales in a way of, you know, taking accounts we already had and like, how can we grow? Mm -hmm. Um, which is really like where that sort of creative mindset helps. Obviously like yeah. during this time, I, I knew a hell of a lot less than what I know now, uh, in, in trying to, to achieve that, but that was, that was the overall goal. Um, and that was, that was the, that was what I really enjoyed, um, over there, like by, by far of, of all the different hats that I wore there was, was trying to solve the problems for, you know, the, the clients I was working with and trying to grow the book of business in that way. Sure. Um, and, and really like gives you an, gives you a, a little bit more well-rounded insight. Because I think, don't get me wrong, some brokerages can be pretty disjointed on like the carrier sales side versus the customer side, right? But where I was, you got a good dose of like a very clear understanding of what the carrier side was like. So to be able to marry that with what these clients needed or the client expectations or whatever it may be, um, was, the, was a, again, was like an insight into that world that I had never really been exposed to in that way. Sure. Um, and then obviously like as I, progress in my career what you know was on that side of things but yeah. that was my kind of my first introduction there what i really enjoyed and that was at strive i was at strive yeah. they got acquired by redwood they're now redwood yeah so i still have, i still have a lot of a lot of friends who like yeah. were still they're there and are now redwood here, aren't they like yeah they've been office on uh on elston like towards elston? lincoln park yeah. okay super nice office yeah. yeah do you know how much it got acquired for strive i actually don't the the big thing that that's that set strive apart was they developed their own tms in-house and it was fin it's the okay. best thing i've ever worked in so that's what redwood bought out and that was there, it was a large that was a large part don't get me wrong like the, yeah. i think strive did a really great job operationally in general but that tech piece was um yeah. definitely what like set them apart in that way sure sure um this is kind of a side topic but with tmss and stuff like do you have one at vho that's like did you make your own tms at vho we are in the process of, okay. of that so um you know, startup with it being early on, there's there's things that, that my team has built internally that is definitely, I'll say this, like it, it, it works for us now and it will scale in the medium term and we are like actively working with the so product you're already, team. You're to, usually using it like day to day. Is like yeah, for, for like kind of what we've cobbled together from sure. my team, yeah. Um, Before that, what were we using? It, slightly less good version of the same thing or you know okay. like this this is all like honestly like not only in-house but like internally for the team um okay. to really put together to to mold to our operation in a way that i really like i i've i've been pro throughout my career um like being able to make those types of decisions of trying to develop things in-house if you have the bandwidth if you have the resources totally. to do so not because i think that you know some of these other third-party providers of tms's aren't good necessarily but there's a all nearly all of them can be customized in some way, but that still takes engineering and security and IT resources on your end, whatever yeah. those changes need to be made. That takes the bandwidth of a team at the TMS to to be able to do that work for you as well. Um, and it tends to come with like a little extra that you don't really need. Whereas like if I can tailor something specific to my needs, which I think more so at Vho than other other parts of other roles I've had in the past, it's like a real. I'm not gonna call it a necessity, but definitely like the I, I think the need for that is is definitely a little bit elevated for what we're trying to build here and being more and we'll get into the VHO stuff at some point, but um, you know, being more tailored to kind of this new world of e-commerce and how you build a, yeah. a logistics company around that. Um and, and so that's what we're working towards getting right now. It's definitely like not complete here, but um I I, I honestly have like very high hopes that we're going to have something pretty cool honestly like th yeah. that really will set us apart in that way once once we really dig into to building this thing out totally i mean it's, it's so important to have like the right tms tailored to your needs i mean it's and especially in e-commerce when you're dealing with so many packages mm -hmm. i can imagine um so we're gonna go back now so you, you were at strive and then you ended up going to to reinhardt food service uh which essentially you're working on the shipper side now uh how did you make that transition 
the like personal story is um, my wife and I had a baby and I realized I had to make more money. Um, but the what was cool about Reinhardt is I got to live in this world where I was working side by side with like the logistics team there that handles all of the inbound that comes into all the various DCs. And I mean, don't quote me, but it was something around 2021, 20, something like that. DCs okay. um, in the country that, you know, things are, are shipping from vendors to. And it was honestly just like an incredibly impressive logistics team that worked there um, that I didn't fully appreciate it or see now, but looking back, like it, it, it is like the, the things I learned there were, were kind of like paramount to being able to, to progress in my career. Okay. Um, but where I got to live in that was working with them, obviously sharing some of the carriers, but because produce is such its own thing and such a different animal, I like sat within the category team and like reported to the, the head of like all produce, right? Okay. Um, and ultimately managed the fresh produce network into all of the DCs. So that was, you know, all reefers, sometimes teams, we're talking the four to five pick Salinas or Yuma loads, um, yeah. you know, sc- shooting south to like Oxnard area to grab your citrus and then heading, heading east. It was all the potatoes and onions in Idaho and Oregon or in New Mexico, depending on time of the year, apples out of Washington, sure. dabbled in some South Texas over the border stuff. It was, it was like not only something just so fundamentally different than anything I'd ever really encountered. And that was kind of cool. Um, but like living in both those worlds, like gave me an opportunity to, like, I, I had to learn how to do other things that were more sourcing related when we're trying to push towards certain vendors or, sure. um, you know, building analysis around things to, that I would have never done before. And I was kind of like given the time and the freedom to, to figure that stuff out. Um, and again, like became, I think sort of like the, the real turning point for me of like, Oh, now this like at a, at, a, at a larger level here, this industry is like really kind of clicking for me. Okay, I've always had issues with produce loads. It's always been, well, the drivers don't want it for the most part because yeah. it's floor loaded. Just dump it on. When you off, was it floor loaded or was it palletized? It was uh, often palletized, but the bigger issue is just the amount of pickups that it is. Okay, and the low rate, right? It's. It's too like the the carriers who do that are magicians at times, man. Like the to be able to it, like the real seasoned vets are on the phone with the four sheds that they're having to pick up from in that day, and they're like haggling on, all right, when can you get me in? Okay, that time. Okay, I'm gonna swing to this other one first, then, and then yeah. I'm gonna uh, circle back around. It it is like a there, there's an art to like being a very efficient produce hauler. Yeah. That. Um, Honestly, it's not, you know, it's not for everybody. It's, it's. And most people are lazy. Most drivers like, like, uh, I don't, I want one pick, one drop. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do produce and all that. No, and to your point, like I would have drivers who are getting up in the warehouse and saying like, no, this is a two drop. I need that pallet, that pallet loaded. And then no, like we would, they'd be orchestrating things. Yeah. Um, you know, to me, I'll, I'll toss you another hundred dollars. If your driver is going to actually do that in an eight, just to make anything on my operation downstream easier. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was a, a, a big part of things. Yeah. For sure. Were you ever dealing with like floor loaded loads for produce or was Reinhardt? I mean, Reinhardt is like an invested large corporation. So like they probably have the money to spend, but like the companies I used to work with for produce was just like pay by the weight. So like, yeah, like I'd literally be selling a load, be like, this depends on how much they load into your trailer. So the drivers, are, they don't even know how much they're going to make until they get like loaded. <laughs> no, that's absolutely thing. And luckily it wasn't anything I had to deal with. Okay. But yeah, you have like... People just throwing potatoes in the back of the drive, yeah. right? Right, just maxing that thing yeah, out. Yeah. It, stuff would always be bailed at least for us, or you okay. know, any Gaylord or something sure. to, to be able to come over. But that, that's absolutely like a yeah. component of things. For yeah, sure. we we ran into some issues at my previous company where they gave us like we had like the greatest sales guy. Uh, he was one of the owners of the brokerage. He was able to get anything from anyone, and like they literally gave us like their whole like they were a potato chip company manufacturer, gave us all our potatoes from Florida and Georgia for like the whole year. And like a month in, they're like, we're just taking all this back. You can't handle this. Because <laughs> we were literally, it was like the funniest thing in the world. We're just using DAT to cover all of it. And drivers are getting pissed. And sure. like the customer is getting pissed because loads would come in. Like, yeah. And it, it, would, it would come in the wrong way. But yeah, either way, produce is always tough for me. Um, so I can imagine at Reinhardt, it wasn't, it wasn't easy on that end. Um, it was, uh, yeah. It, I, I don't like miss dealing with that, but it was yeah. great experience. I'll put it that way. Mm. Sure. And so you worked with a lot of brokers when you were at Reinhardt, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have like any that you remember that were just like, wow, these people were amazing? So from Reinhardt, I have my my two kind of like my two day ones who I bring with me every place I go. Okay. And that like without fail, I'm bringing you with me. You're now. So 
I moved from Reinhardt to Home Chef. They came with Home Chef. I moved from Home Chef to Viho. They run for us at Viho. Okay. It's um, so a- absolutely like found you like you know very like long term relationships with these with these people yeah. there. Um, I actually went out to dinner with one of them last night. They were they were in in Chicago. Nice. Um, so there there was absolutely that. But you won't tell us who they are. You don't want to. Well, 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 you don't want to tell the world but who the good brokers are. <laughs> I, I will say though, like that being the first experience of actually like cultivating a carrier in a broker base and really seeing, obviously like I got exposure to the carrier side at Strive, but I got to see like how Strive's operations were as a broker, which sure. like now having experience in in in, in dealing with other brokers, I, I think they did a, a pretty good job overall. Okay. Um, definitely compared to some of the brokers that I've dealt with for normally pretty short amount of times if things aren't, aren't going well. But yeah. what what has been the case for me, and this applies to Reinhardt, but it applies even to Home Chef and Vio as I go, is like I've, I've lived in this world now of either perishable shipping or like ex- incredible or like an expedited need for everything I sure. do. And so that's not for every broker. That's not for every carrier. That like I'm, I, I have requirements for you as someone who's hauling things for me that others don't. And so... I'm cognizant of that in that, especially when it's a carrier's market, that like that, what what I'm asking is something beyond what a normal shipper is asking. And so, you know, when, when load to truck ratios are crazy, crazy high, I, yeah. it, I, I'm, I'm always aware of the fact that like these guys can go and get much easier freight than what I'm doing. But so that, ultimately like, that's, that's where the relationship part comes in. But that's, it's also very easy then to weed out who is not going to work for those those sorts of needs because sure. at the end of the day what i tend to do is the broker that i'm working with or the various brokers that i'm working with that's my sourcing arm mm-hmm. i don't have the resources nor do i really want to dedicate the resources to be cold calling joe's trucking in texas oh, totally because not. i'm looking to set up a program yeah. i have no information about yeah. joe or his business i have mm-hmm. no historical data whereas a broker i can go to my guy and say i'm going to stand up this lane yeah. And they're going to pull up their TMS and be like, these five carriers run this for us consistently. Here's our best performer. And like, they've already done something that I may never even achieve with a team of, of carrier sales reps because I may not just have, be having conversations with these, with these carriers. Yeah. Um, and so putting that on them, being as transparent as possible, um, but also being real, like, I need driver contact info. Like, I'm never going to steal your carrier. This is all through you, but I need contact info. I need... Um, you know, like the most proactive of updates possible Mm -hmm. from you. Um, We'll put requirements in there, especially like now with things of like your driver must be pre-fueled. We have like very strict transit time requirements that we're implementing for this, this load. Mm -hmm. Um, Other other things like that, that again, like if you're not dealing with a broker who feels invested and like wants to work with you, they're going to, they're going to tell you to kick rocks. They they, they can go find easier business out there. Um, but that, that really like started at Reinhardt out of necessity because of everything you're talking about with these protest loads. It sure. like, it, it's not for the, it, I don't, it, you, you really gotta be dedicated to wanting to do that stuff to be able to do it well. Totally. And when you were at Reinhardt or Home Chef later on, were you like just getting bombarded, uh, like for solicitation calls from brokers? Oh yeah. Uh, how did that look like? Were you just like working one like throughout the day and like just phone calls would come in from freight brokers or emails like how, how would that look like yeah it, it's pretty frequent um even still and this was in, okay even at viho yeah okay so of, you, of, it may, mainly through email um who's emailing you mostly i mean all the big players are emailing but, yeah. they're probably yeah. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. one of them um uh, but yeah no it's i would say like home chef i got it more okay um i think it makes a lot that to me, if you're a carrier, that makes a heck of a lot more sense. Like, there's a retail business with Home Chef at every Kroger store. There's also sure. like the e-com side. Um, I think, without really understanding the industry, if you're a carrier, you may not connect that people who ship parcels around like need third-party providers to handle a lot of their middle mile. Even the biggest players in in the U.S. do that, right? With mm-hmm. with, the, with outsourcing some of their line hauls. So, um, it, it's a little less so now, but it 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 still is pretty frequent. I would say, my philosophy in general has been like to stay open-minded about bringing people on, but also like I keep a pretty tight carrier base at all times. And if I see a need based on, it could be regional, it could be purely volume related. It could be, there's a whole host of reasons why I might want to add somebody, but like I am not just 
grabbing 10 brokers at once, doing a waterfall contract process. Because like, again, to, to what I was saying earlier, like I need people dedicated to all of the extra things I'm asking them to do here yeah. to be solid providers. And if you're not getting any business, you have no real incentive to like go above and beyond. Sure. And so again, we, we, I, I have in, in every role I've been in where I've kind of been in control of building that base out and maintaining that base, I keep it, again, I, I keep it close and like, as, as proactive communication, as, as proactive as communication can be outside of just day-to-day -day load stuff. Like I'm mulling some sort of new consolidation plan that we're looking to do. I'm at Home Chef. We were doing everything outbound. Hey, I realized there's an opportunity to build an inbound network here and do some consolidation. Like I'm going to these carrier, these broker partners and I'm pitching that. I'm like, this is something I have in mind that I would want to start doing. Like, do you have carriers in this area? Do you have any experience doing something like this? And like engaging with them in these conversations, they might not win the business, but like they feel like they're a part of these conversations. Sure. Uh, you can't do that when you got 25 different carriers that you're just kind of like blanket emailing. Totally. Um, and so, so that's been a, a, like a key component of, of finding the right partners. Totally. Well, what advice would you give to like freight brokers that are looking for business? Um, like if they were to reach out to you, like what would stick out? What would make you want to work with them? Give them a shot. Being caught up on my inbox, so I actually see it is one part. But <laughs> no, I, I do think like it's a tough question. Some of it is like so much of, of any of this stuff is like you're in the right place at the right time. Sure. I would say like the one thing that will stick out to me is calling out like places, regions, whatever, where you are like you can say we specialize in this and not just like we specialize in reefer. Everybody says that, but like your niche in some, specific. but yeah, you can say we cover the whole U S but like have a, I don't know, hundred dedicated tractors in Atlanta Metro that handle local stuff. And like, if you are doing stuff like that and you're being smart about who you're emailing that to, yeah. I'm going to look at that. I'm using like home chef as an example here. Cause there's an Atlanta FC there, but okay. You know, I'm going to look at that and be like, oh, interesting. Because, like, it's perfect. local rates now, I mean, I remember I used to book, like, local Chicago runs at Stratford, like, $300. That's not, that's not how, the, how the world works anymore here. So like, How much are they right now? I just don't even know. I mean, like, you'll hear. I was paying 250 like, two, two years, three years ago. I mean, I'll get quotes back for local stuff where yeah. they're like, oh, that'll be 600 And I'm like, we'll find a little better. Don't get me wrong. But, like, yeah, yeah $500 as, like, a, what a broker's coming back to you at in, okay. in, like, any kind of, not any major metro, but in a lot of places. You know, you'll find a few who can do a little better. Um, sure. you know, but as, as sort of, like, the average of if I'm just, like, shooting something out to hear a ballpark rate, it's mm -hmm. gotten up there. Okay. Um, point being, like, if, if you're able to show that you have this thing, and again, and especially if you can target it at who you're reaching out to, yeah. that's going to set you apart, or at least give you a better shot. Yeah. Um, there's too much, like, there's too much vague, yeah, we do this, because we could obviously service your business without, like, <laughs> I, like, I've had conversations with people where I was interested because of something I knew about them, mm -hmm. and it just turned into the same sales pitch, which, like, yeah, I mean, it takes work to really develop that and, and, and understand that you need to, like, tailor certain things to certain businesses. If totally. you're getting on a call with me and asking me what I do for what Beho does, what Home Chef does, whatever, when I'm there, um, it's an immediate red flag of like, I'm, I'm going to get the standard sales pitch. Like, let's, yeah. let's cut this call early type thing. Um, so, I mean, that, that's what really sets things apart in my, in my opinion. Um, sure. And then obviously, like, the service has to be there when, when you have the business. But mm -hmm. even to get in the door is, is you, you, ha you have to show something more than the, the typical sales pitch. Yeah. And I think people need to understand, and some people do, but like, Disrupting a client or a shipper's supply chain is a big deal. Yeah. It's expensive. It, if something goes wrong, it's 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 on the, the decision maker who did that. Like I get nervous when I'm changing carriers on a single lane, much less like, hey, I want to take over like all this new business for you. Just because yeah. just because something's different doesn't mean it's better necessarily, right? Totally. And and like you're you're sort of putting a decent amount of faith in this person and hopefully they've worked with you to kind of like you know, alleviate some of your concerns with, with changing things up. But like it, it is, it's not insignificant, even if we're talking about a single lane for a shipper to change up what they are doing when it is like contracted consistent business. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, sales reps who understand that, I, I think that just having that mindset will go a long way. Sure. I feel like in the last few years, there's been so many new brokerages on the market that aren't, uh, and like brokerages, like companies and brokers in general that aren't trained well. Um, you get these training courses on YouTube where it's like 
how to become a millionaire being a freight broker. And it's like you get all these people that actually open up an MCU without working at a brokerage and then just start spam calling essentially every shipper they can mm. and just like hoping one of them will give them a load, right? And so I think that's like a problem. And it's like back like 20 years ago, it was like American Backhaulers and CH Robinson. There was like there wasn't that much competition, but now it's just flooded with competition. There's way too many of them. And that's why you, you, you probably see an increase like – of the amount of calls you get yeah, for solicitation definitely. recently. Yeah. That's why I've heard that from a lot of people. So that's why like I, I feel like right now, like for anyone that's in the industry, it's so important to like actually understand what you're doing. Like what's the goal? Like know who you're calling, what are you specializing in? Just like you said, super important. Um so Mark, a- after Reinhardt, you ended up running the logistics at Home Chef. Uh can you tell us more about Home Chef and what kind of problems you were solving there on a daily basis? So I joined Home Chef, um, I don't know, maybe three months. It was right after they were acquired by Kroger. So okay. Home Chef. Were acquired for, do you know? I'm, just, I'm always curious about the I actually numbers. did, because I was prior to my time there, so I'm not Got entirely it. sure. It was, there was a bunch of kickers involved, but okay. like, you know, hundreds of millions in, in sure. total there. Um, and at the time, it was, you know, still a startup growing, like expanding pretty, pretty um, steadily year over year, but everything logistics related was kind of handled by FedEx who was doing any of the uh, kind of zone skipping line hauls for them. They had kind of like set up that program for home chef, everything that was coming inbound was vendor delivered for the most part. There was a couple, you know, a couple exceptions. Right. Sure. And then um, everything else is, is parcel because like it was, it was all e-com. So yeah. it's either local pickup or again, FedEx managing that line haul um, with the, the acquisition by Kroger sets up, okay, now we need an outbound retail network to go with this retail product that we're going to be putting in Kroger's. Um, so that's what I was brought on to do was like to, to establish that, that cold chain network to all the Kroger locations throughout the country, all the, all the different brands. Okay. Um, which was like the, the first, you know, obviously they had just been acquired, but it was still very much like a startup feel. Okay. Um, it was my first experience to that. And like, man, did they have some impressive people over there? Like it was, it was really like you, you understood why they had gotten to that point with like Kroger being interested in them and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just that like, there was never a need for, for this logistics piece in the way that they needed it now. Right. There was sure. little things handled here and there, but, uh, to the scale that they needed. So came out to build that and it was a whirlwind cause it was literally week one. I start and my boss is like, okay, we're shipping to Cincinnati next week. We got to figure it out. It, it, it was just that. And, mm-hmm. and so, um, you know, having those relationships with, with, carriers who handled perishables and bringing produce at, mm-hmm. at Reinhardt helped me a lot. Cause I could, I could lean on, on those brokers. I had yeah. built those relationships with, um, and we, you know, able to slowly build out a team there. But what was, what was cool about it is as that grew, it became, Oh, Hey, now there's this opportunity for an inbound network. And I had done dabbled in this a little bit at Reinhardt too, which was sort of my exposure to that of essentially what we started to do was use our own FCs as cross stocks. Okay. So rather than, you know, one load to each of the three FCs for Home Chef. It was one load consolidated pickup into Chicago for four or five different vendors. And then I'm doing single loads out to the other two from Chicago. Sure. Um, like huge opportunity to capture savings there, right? Yeah, but now yeah, I'm just totally. expanding my network, expanding the lanes I'm running, which and eventually... You were in charge of that. You decided like you, you wanted to implement that or was that like... Yeah, so I had, you know... That's smart. The, the new guy pitching it, but it like, yeah. like it was agreed to, and we, we started doing that. A lot, um, of, a lot of shippers waste so much money because they're not smart is, about it. Yeah, it was it was it was a cool thing that like there was opportunity there, but there was also like people there who were yeah, let's do it, let's mm-hmm. let's let's give it a shot. Awesome. Um, from there, then just like as the ecom world changed, as like more and more purchases came that way, um, it became pretty clear that like we needed additional management and just oversight of like all the e-commerce stuff as well so that was like the next piece that came came into like what my team and i managed so again like the the zone skips being managed by fedex a lot of that didn't change but it was like how do we expand our footprint for to offer an earlier delivery to more people in more areas by by utilizing this sort of zone skip Mm -hmm. um framework it was then you know when the the pandemic hit it was okay services plummeted right and it was atrocious mm-hmm. um it's not even all like the national carrier's fault it was just like all these things coming together and really end of the day um you know your fedexes your ups is like we're not built for like this new world of e-commerce like their infrastructure and their network is incredibly impressive but like the 
fluctuations and all the demand that has now like entered that world is just there. I, I just, you know, weren't quite ready for it. Then let's, let's add a pandemic on top of that where yeah. nobody's going anywhere. So now people need things shipped to them. Right. Um, so it was absolutely like a, we need to diversify our carrier base. Um, especially if you're shipping a perishable product, like that arrives to customer late, like where that's, that's a credit or a refund, right? That that's, that's money directly out of my pocket because it didn't get there in time. Um, and so that, that became like a very, that was my favorite part of, of all of the, everything at Home Chef was, was finding who I could utilize where. We built some very sophisticated tools around zips that could be shared between carriers so that we could optimize these line hauls. So when I have, okay. by default, I have 1.1 trucks worth of volume falling to this one carrier. So now I got to send two full truckloads for like, you know, let's say 32 total pallets, right? And I can't yeah. double stack. So we we developed tools to be like, oh, these zips are shared with this carrier, so let's move those two pallets to this. And now we just have one fully optimized truck, and this blends in with the quarter of a truck that was that was uh, still empty from this carrier. Okay. To allow us to like cut out all this extra fat, right, and to to help bring our costs down while shipping costs in general are obviously going up, right? Yeah. Um, weirdly enough, like that was how I first got involved with Vho was onboarding Vho as a as a logistics provider at home chef and how like that relationship started in the first place yeah so you transitioned from home chef to vho was it a year and a half ago a year almost exactly a year it was august of 2021 okay and so c can you tell us about like why why did you transition to vho um what was that like and now you're the head of transportation there what what i got at home chef and getting to like build something out like, not that there's, I mean, the people over there are still building, right? But, like, yeah. I got to build this thing up. The, the idea of getting to do that again was kind of intriguing. Sure. Um, it's one of those things where, like, be careful what you wish for because that comes with a hell of a lot of stress and work and everything else. But, like, that was what I wanted to do again. Yeah. Now and it's so, on a bigger scale because this, right. like, this is all direct to consumer, essentially, B2C, right? That's where we were talking. In, in the yeah, end of the day, like, VHO yeah. is all B2C. And yeah. Home Chef was more B2B. Well, Home Chef was B two B for the the retail product. It yeah. was and for the inbound network, it was B two C for all of the e com ordering. Okay, so it was a blend, I guess we could look sure, at sure. it that way. Um, so getting to build that at at Vho was was like really what intrigued me. Okay, and it was like you know I, I had known the founders of Vho since 2019 when they originally you know came into Home Chef to kind of pitch. Um, so I ended up onboarding them about a year later, but had always kept in touch, um, and. You know, in, in talking with Ita, the founder, was in just, you know, a, a, as they're scaling and, you know, I'm adding markets as they add them with Home Chef and I'm shipping to them. But, like, at a at a certain part, he knew and we would talk about, like, there needs to be an operation that is now connecting these markets so that we are not reliant, Vho is not reliant on clients bringing 100% of packages to each market where the final mile delivery is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, just staying in touch with him on that and kind of expressing my interest of, you know, we, we had built a, a really good relationship at that point um, of, you know, w when you're looking to to do that, to start building that, like, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, Definitely. And that was where that was where it all started. So it was a year ago today it was me, with a team of two at that point, a year ago today, me and one other person to start building that out. And now it's 25, right? 24, 25 now. You know, we're yeah. up to 25 now yeah. for the, the transfo team, yeah. Okay. Could you tell us, like, in one sentence, like, what Vho is? Just, like, like keep it real simple and who like who would you say your main competitor is yeah i think vho is the, the best way to look at vho is it's a tech enabled logistics provider that's like tailor made for this new world of e-commerce and it's like just incredibly focused on customer experience in ways that a lot of other providers aren't um i mean if, if you want to talk about competitors to me as as we continue to grow and evolve this thing like i'm now competing in bids with the fedexes and the ups's and the you large know. regionals of the world um you know that didn't necessarily feel like the case maybe a year ago but like, i think we've graduated to that where like that's who i am looking at that's who i am kind of benchmarking against to to figure out what i can do better how i can better optimize the network to ultimately enable like, what the vho platform does for for last mile sure and uh so you started a year ago two people now it's 24, 25 people, and you're the head of transportation. Like, can you tell us about the process of like when you started a year ago to where it is now, and like what do you do on a daily basis? So first big thing, and, and this is the hardest thing to solve in my opinion when you're when you're first starting this out. It's where a lot of, as as like a quick tangent, it's where a lot of 
logistics providers fail here, there's dozens now of last mile providers that can cover a limited area if you bring them your stuff, right? And mm -hmm. then like those are the players that are going out to the three PLs and the aggregators of the world who are taking smaller e-commerce suppliers and like leveraging that overall volume, and then they can get get the packages there. Not only do I think Vho is better than them at the last mile, like the whole like the the ninety nine point nine on time, the four point nine CSAT aren't just like the numbers we throw out. That's like stuff we track to metrics we track to weekly and things we achieve. So not, mm -hmm. not only do I think we outperform those players, yeah, we're now also. Like what my team does for Viho now is to offer that full end to end, and and so with, with that in mind, like the hardest thing to figure out as you're as you're looking to expand, you're looking to start connecting markets, allowing for larger mixed injections into one place where a sort will happen, and then and then middle mass shuttles go out. Is how do you go about pricing that? Because you either need to be competitive with the FedExes, the large regionals, the UPSs, whoever of the world, in order to win that business or you need to cover your costs and then you're wildly uncompetitive. Yeah. And so what is your strategy there and what is your methodology to coming to a to these middle mile rates that you can then feel comfortable to bring to clients or prospective clients and they're not going to laugh you out of the room and be like $5 a package I pay one with FedEx. No, it's like I need to I need to try to hit that same that same cost that like FedEx is tacking on for that zone 3 shipment or whatever it may be. Sure. And so that was kind of the first, not kind of, that was the first big project that I've really sunk my teeth into here is like, how do we develop that so we can start quoting it out? We can start gaining this business. Um, it then like moved pretty quickly into, okay, let's launch this, this network. And we started in Texas. Where um, in Texas? Huh? Where in Texas? Dallas is, is like the, the main sort. Okay. Uh, and then we hit Houston, Austin, San Antonio daily for, okay. for next day delivery. Um, that, it was... It's a little hectic at first. It, it's a lot, and again, I'm I'm asking a lot of carriers when we're doing this, right? I'm I, I'm 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 saying, truck is pre-fueled. I need all your driver contact. Some of these are drop trailers, right? And I need direct to the receivers. You're fresh on hours. Nobody's showing up, and it's going to be cutting it close. Um, you know, we have our labor planned at these end markets to be able to receive that truck, do that route level sort, and launch sure. out the next day. And you know, I. I am not okay with me personally and like my team, not okay with like us being the reason that our OTD falls in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, the if I'm taking literally thousands of packages from point A to point B and something goes wrong, that's a lot, right? And yeah. and so like we have some contingencies built in place. You know, we're doing if need be, like we're on the phone with a roadside assistance provider at two a.m. in the morning to like get that truck up back and running because it broke down somewhere in the middle of its run, and it's still like to allow it to still arrive and us get those packages out. And like it's obviously, it's, it's not an ideal situation, but yeah, but, but like ultimately, we we have to hit that on time, right? That's yeah. that's that's the goal. Um, it, it's not a good customer experience when when that's not the case, and like the brands that we work with recognize that, right? So, yeah. anyways, we're trying to figure that out and then implementing it was was definitely. Again, it was stressful. It was with a very small team at first. Um, but that has now expanded to where, in essence, Vho operates as a regional carrier in six different regions. Is is really, like, at the end of the day, how we run. With, like, now a few new clients that will be onboarding here in the, in the upcoming months that will start enabling, like, inter-regional uh, middle-mile shuttles and really starting to expand this out to, you know, now, I'm, now I'm covering from not just play, points within this region, but, you know, we have we have two day transit points where we're injecting here. We're going up to the northeast. We're gonna be you know continually expanding that out, and that's sort of like the the next frontier here, while also continuing to optimize all of those regional networks. Sure. Um, so it's it's a lot going on, but it's a lot of honestly, it's a, it's a lot of fun to solve those puzzles, frankly. Totally. And just to get this uh, correct, Vho essentially has local drivers that go around picking up packages, and then they take it to the sortation center, and then the sortation center, you get like. 3PL or a carrier to come and pick that up and take it to the next sortation center. Is that how it works? Or so all of the first. So the best way to look at it is, VHO's platform enables our last mile drivers to find the route. They get they 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 select their route through the app. They get paid through that. Pay pay those drivers those driver partners. I should say, um, two times a week. So it's more steady gig economy business compared to you know driving for DoorDash or whatever. And they handle all of the last mile stuff now. Okay. Um, what, the, what what Transpo yeah. handles is the first in the middle. Okay. So we are maybe we're putting our own truck on it. Um, you know we do operate a small small fleet of box trucks. 
um, or I'm going to one of my brokers and one of my carriers to make pickups from a client. And then like okay. same thing goes from, so anything from client to VHO and anything from VHO to VHO. Got it. Um, it is, is what falls under us essentially. Got it. Okay. Um, so let's see here. How does uh, VHO's network look like right now from like where you took it to where it is at the moment? You said you've expanded to different warehouses. Can you tell us more about the expansion and what, what kind of cities are you doing like one day or two day service in? So in all the regional um, networks that we're running here, and we're, and we're in 22 markets now, um, and like continually expanding, we've got, um, I don't, don't want to maybe commit to it because I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure we're launching the new, if it's, if it's not next week, it's the okay. week after we're launching another market that's going to spoke off of Dallas as well. Oklahoma City is next on okay. the... Uh, and it's going to connect with Dallas. Right. So like, give yeah. me give me all your Oklahoma City, your Austin, yeah. your Houston, your Dallas, and your San Antonio, bring it all to Dallas, or I'll pick it up and bring it to Dallas, and then we'll, we'll get it where awesome. it needs to go for next day. Um, so just continually expanding that out. Like I said, we are you know, making deliveries in all of those 22. Uh, many of them operate as... Maybe they'll take some injections, but for the most part, like they are the recipients of this middle mile, right? We're doing the sort, we're getting it, we're getting it to these spokes. Um, and again, it, it's it's kind of doing this somewhat, I wouldn't say independently, but like you know, operating each region kind of as its own region. Mm -hmm. And it's where, like, to circle back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, having the right broker partners is kind of and carrier partners is kind of makes it. it it's it enables growth on my end and my ability to do this in a way that like would be impossible if I said, all right, let's start calling carriers in Florida because we're standing up that network. Let's yeah. start calling carriers out of Atlanta because we're standing that up and out of Philly. And so instead, hey, again, be my sourcing arm. Know all of my expectations yeah. and like don't mess around, but like be my sourcing arm. Help me find the right carrier. So like on top of everything I've already outlined of like the requirements we asked for, we also asked for dedicated carriers. So we essentially find dedicated carriers to run 100% of our contracted lanes, but do it through our broker partners. Okay. Um, and to do that in every single region, again, is not, I don't think it's feasible in the amount of time that we have, in the short totally. amount of time that we've expanded. Um, for context, since beginning of the year, so year to date, our middle mile volume that we run on a week-to-week -week basis is up a 55 percent okay um so to to see that to to be in in a you know current economic environment where there's like some concern and th there's signs of slowing but like we are enabling continued growth by being able to connect these markets together and allow for larger injections to make things easier on our clients and still offer that kind of phenomenal service level and all the customer experience yeah. uh, focus that comes with VHO has, has been a really cool thing to see as we've continued to scale. But along with that, we're also just adding new markets, adding new markets, adding new markets. Um, mm -hmm. So within the last few weeks, Tampa and Cincinnati have launched, St. Louis has launched, um, all with the ability to connect to, you know, where where these regions that we're already kind of running our middle mile shuttles within. Sure. And you mentioned, uh, Mark, that you have 99.9% .9 on-time delivery. Mm -hmm. That's insane. It's, uh, it's, it's, wild. it's, it's <laughs> like... I don't mean this in a bad way. It's it's all like almost a level of like obsessive. Like this is this is what we strive for. We will not compromise on yeah. the on this number. Um, and it, it is something we look at. It, it like Ita, the founder, co-founder, um, is is just huge on that to be able to hit that from a obviously from a service standpoint to to our our clients we work with is huge. But like the the customer is ultimately kind of like where our focus goes. So. And we can get into some of the other things we do to like make it an easier process for for the for consumers, um, but to be able to offer that to give them that reliability, um, and you know it, we and we have a very diversified like client base. But like when you're shipping perishables as as we do in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. and coming from that world, like it is an awful customer experience when your box shows up a day late and you open it up and and like the meat and everything in there is warm and unusable. Totally, like yeah. that that those are, that's your family's meals for the next few days. So. Yeah. Um, you know, keeping that in mind, and again, that applies to everybody. I, it's just that my, my experience comes from there. Um, it is it is like absolutely paramount that we are always always reaching for that, achieving that that level of of performance. Yeah. Uh, do you know by any chance like what where like where FedEx is at in the like on time delivery spot? It. <sighs> I, I don't like a hundred percent know. It must be like what, like at seventy percent. I'm guessing. It's better than that. It's better. Better than that. Okay. Um, here's what's hard about some of that stuff. I. And I don't want to speak to, like to what it is actually because I I hear different numbers and like there's certain different ways to calculate it. Kind of difficult. They they actually give out that information. So they do. Um, 
there's certain things that go on. So like now, like the, the nationals, as an example, like when you go into peak, the nationals will tweak their transit days. Yeah. And like pad a little bit to allow their their networks to just take on all that additional volume, that influx that's going to come from from peak shipping season through the holidays and into New Year, right? Um, so like the on time there that that's that's really where you see like a lot of the on time reporting because that's such a such a key yeah everybody in the industry has their eyes on peak right mm-hmm. um so it's a, it's a situation where like the on time reporting is it's reporting to what their promise is but it's it's been sort of skewed mm-hmm. um i'll say in my experience like it got pretty bad during the early part of the pandemic i i i there was improvement like by the nationals and and by the regionals who like kind of struggled um Nobody is doing what Viho is, is doing from a performance standpoint. Um, you know, obviously we have a long way to go from a scale standpoint to, sure. to get to be on the same playing ground as them. But like to be competing with these big players now, winning this business and and servicing it still to the level that we that we promise mm-hmm. um, ha- has been has been cool to see. And and again, I think this this speaks to the nature of Viho in, in being created specifically for e-commerce. Mm-hmm. And so. All like the the tech that that we have is honestly like phenomenal. Like the the driver partner app, so that they're able to see their routes and everything. All of that, all the routing that's done, is super impressive. I want to take now like all of those same resources, all of that, um, like tailored to this new world of e-commerce, and build our network and build our our tech on the middle mile and the first mile side of things to that. Avoid the rigidity that comes with. That has come for some of these larger carriers, which is like growing in a world that was purely parcel shipments. And like, you know, some e-com, that has increased over the years, but nothing like what we see now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so being able to build a network that is flexible, is dynamic by default in its construction, I think is going to be something that also will help set Viho apart to be able to connect to that, like, again, that like phenomenally well done last mile side of the business. Sure. And how is Viho preparing for uh, peak season, like the the winter months, or I guess the fall months, or or the most amount of shipments you're you're probably expecting to see. So, like, are you preparing right now for that uh, for the next few months? I certainly am. Um, what are you doing to, to be prepared? So, the, we're we're gonna get really close to the crunch here of like any additional equipment that you think you might need, box trucks, whatever. Like, yeah. it's gonna be gone pretty soon, right? That, okay. and, and that's how it is every year. Um, we. As a as a general philosophical way that I go about maintaining my my broker my carrier network, I yes have contracted rates. I expect you to run it for that rate, but I am not one. I don't think I'm really in a position to like try to leverage have this type of leverage. But I also just like fundamentally fundamentally disagree with the hard line that some shippers or people on the client side take of like I don't care that the market has flipped. You're running every load for that rate. Yeah, and so and this is a two way door. Right. So something happens, the market flips, things get crazy during peak. I would much rather spend another couple dollars per load to keep the same quality carrier who everyone at my sites know who it is. They're dedicated. They're, the, the familiarity is there to keep them running on that than have to then tell my broker, no, get out of here, keep the same rate. And now he's got to go find likely a like poor quality carrier who's going to accept a sub market rate. Sure. Right. Um, and so, like, I think we have built in and just, like, the way that we handle this uh, a way to help mitigate some of that. Like, serving the customer is number one here, right? I, the optimization work, the, the fleet expansion little bit that we can do here, you know, as, as we continue to grow, are going to continue to be levers that allow us to mitigate some cost, optimization being the big one. Um, I'm talking daily optimization of how, how we connect things, how we run things, the size of the trucks we're putting on things, right, to just mm-hmm. strip out as much cost as we can. Um, if I need to take on a little more to to continually service and, and hit those high high levels of performance and get things to customers like that, I'm going to do that. Um, so I think that helps us there. Um, and then, like I said, it's a two way door. So as things calm down, we're going right back to the carriers. Hey, this is what the market's showing now. Like sure. we're now well above, and like those adjustments will be made. And that's the that's the type of stuff. Again, this kind of all comes full circle, but like the type of stuff that you can do with like a dedicated strong broker or carrier partner that you've built that relationship with Mm -hmm. like nobody's ever going to take advantage of the other person it's all it's all on a level playing field um and you just you know continue to to service the business to to the level that needs to be serviced sure um and then mark so 
you have some straight box trucks you mentioned, right? You have do, like yeah. a you have a small fleet, and then you have to outsource certain elements to the supply chain industry to to three PLs carriers. Um, how do you know a good logistics provider when outsourcing the work you can't do? What qualities set them apart? So uh, I feel like we've we've touched on a lot of this stuff already, yeah. but I I do think like. Again, I've 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 been in conversations with people and been you know hit the parameters that we have. Like, I need you to go out and source one to two dedicated carriers on this. This will be an everyday thing, or there's ten of these a week, or whatever it may be. Um, we need same carrier on it. We need carrier contact every time. We need you know two hours before pickup and acknowledgement everything's good. We need pre-fueled straps, load docks, all, all the other stuff. And I've had people be like, we're not going to give you all that information. And all right, it's great talking with you, man. Like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's even in a market that is, and again, it's softened recently, which has been a nice relief, but yeah. even in what is like really a carrier's market, like I, I cannot waver on like some of these requirements just by the nature of my business. Like I can't even fathom the type because I, I just haven't been in it. It's been like produce, then perishable and now yeah. expedited next day delivery stuff. Right. Um, I, I, I dream sometimes of like the type of business where I can be like, oh, half the loads didn't pick up today. Whatever, let's roll them tomorrow. <laughs> no, no big deal. Um, because I've just never really been in that world. But yeah. um, because like very much because of that, like we have to have these very high requirements. Sure. Um, and it's, you can tell like pretty early on if it's going to work out with somebody. And I, I'm not saying like one mistake means you're fired here, but like it's a very short leash. Oh. Um, and, you know, it could just be, I got to take you off this lane. Like it's not, we can still do business together in general, but like that needs to go. Or it could be like, I see fundamental flaws with your operation and you're not going to be able to give me what I need. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm well aware of the elevated ask that we have for a lot of things, but that's just what comes with the territory here. I, I can't just hope for the best and, and not be all over you to track things and to make sure that we're getting all the proactive updates we need and all the other requirements that we have. Cause my, my business will suffer to a degree that, like just isn't acceptable if, if I, if I don't allow that. Um, so again, that, that's the big one. And like, I, I do enjoy, and I, and I do like less interaction directly with our carriers now, but like, I do enjoy just like the chop it up ses- sessions of like, we can talk about some new stuff that's maybe coming, but like, I want to hear about what's going on with you guys. Like where, where are you picking up more business now? Is there any expansion happening on your end? What's like reading freight waves and everything. Like I, I try to keep up on things. Mm-hmm. My favorite way to go out and hear what's happening though is like, what are the brokers seeing? Sure. They're getting, they're hearing from the shippers and they're hearing from the carriers, and they they have a a pretty clear picture if they're doing enough business, right? If they're if they're if they're at a certain scale, to have their kind of finger on the pulse of, of things that are trending that are maybe not being discussed everywhere. Yeah. Um, and like all of that, just that that relationship aspect of things, I find to be really really important. Um. It's interesting that when you start to talk into like freight matching tech and everything and, and mm-hmm. how that, that plays into it. But like, at least for me right now with what we do, um, that, that, that's big for me. Sure. I like that. Good response. Um, and now we're going to transition to last mile. Uh, since last mile has been a hot topic for quite some time and you've been at the center of it in many companies, including right now, Viho, can you tell us more about the supply chain and the differences in handling the logistics from first mile to middle mile and last mile? How does the supply chain interact with Beho? Yeah, you know, last mile is a different world, man. It really is. Um, the tech on that side of the industry has been pretty cool to see of the different routing capabilities and everything and ways to make stuff more efficient in that way. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of like, there's a lot of similar things too if you're trying to optimize your logistics network, but it's it's just far more granular because we're talking about 20, 30, 50 stops, right? And, and finding the best way to do it. Um, like that, I, I wish I had the number because I, I read this article fairly recently, um, but about like the in-house tech that UPS developed years ago okay. to optimize their routes and just like the sheer amount of millions that it saves year over year. Yeah. Because again, like there's so many stops being in, that, that are involved here that like even a fractional amount of efficiency that you can gain is just amplified to an yeah. unbelievable degree. Um, so on the last mile side of things, again, like I think what sets Vho apart on top of just like the the, the service levels that, that we offer, one is is the driver partners. Like, again, we can offer them a little more stability. We can offer them, they know how long the route should take. They know 
what they're getting paid for that route, and we pay them twice a week. So there, there's a lot of benefits there to drive for VHO versus versus some some other options that they may have. Um, in addition to that, like honestly, and this is more of a qualitative thing, I guess, but I, I obviously I think like down the road you could you can quantify it. Like I think the people at our warehouses that like help with the launch and everything. From what like the, the times where I've been on site and seen, I, I think like our people on the ground are phenomenal in that. And like in helping and making sure any first time drivers or like fairly new people are doing everything that's needed to be done, um, trying to keep things safe because you know, it's, it's cars driving in and out of the warehouse. Yeah. Um, they're all over that stuff. And it, it's it's really impressive. And like and just like makes drivers want to do VHO a little bit more. They're not being hassled for stuff. They're not sitting around for the restaurant that's taking half an hour longer to make the food that they need to deliver for DoorDash, right? It, it, sure. they're, they're, like that level of, of kind of like human connection is like a big focus that goes you know beyond customer, also goes to like our driver partners and everything else. Um, I think that kind of like I mentioned earlier, there's again like dozens of companies that are now trying to do this or you know companies that are doing this themselves. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're able to, some of them are doing it like not poorly. Again, I, I'm, I'm going to always cheer for, for, v, for VHO, and I think we do a better job. But, like, they're not necessarily doing a poor job. It is really now up to my team and, like, the, the larger operations at, at VHO mm -hmm. to marry everything that needs that, – that enables us to be a full end-to-end -end provider to that last mile. Sure. Um, and the enhancements that are being made to the route-building side of things and, and, and everything on, on that side um, are pretty impressive and have been helpful in that way. Like the next step to kind of techify our abilities to connect to that, I'm incredibly excited about. Not just to like help us from a day to day standpoint in, in how we manage things, but also to better connect to that and offer better visibility of like what exact, like all of the specific packages that are coming on each specific middle mile truck to help better optimize our sort to get through that faster, to be able to launch faster and ultimately like launch more delivery routes each day because the whole point of this is, is to continue to grow, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's an interesting like again like I mentioned earlier, it's an interesting puzzle to put together. Um, but like the having that baseline that VHO has, um, makes, it is a wonderful thing to be able to like. That's what I'm tying into is that. So like I never look at it like I did all this work and now they're failing on the on the last mile because like, it it's just like done so phenomenally well, um, and like the continued improvement that we're seeing there, uh, or like enhancements I guess we'll say that we're, that we're building into that only like makes me more confident, but then like, you know, sort of sets that expectation for me and my team, like you need to have your stuff together. Like you need to make sure that what you're building is, is equally as impressive and um, performs at the same levels. Yeah, definitely. And you did mention earlier that when you started at VHO, you were trying to work on the pricing point where like FedEx could offer for $1 VHO is at a $5 mm -hmm. point. And I kind of want to build on top of that because first of all, see like how were you able to, lower your price to can be, able, be able to compete with FedEx. And also on top of that, this like regionals versus nationals. Uh, Cause like one of the sticky points to switch carriers to regionals is the cost of line haul. And it's like to minimize, how to minimize the cost to get the freight to the sortation center. So how do you manage the middle mile question so that you can have more shippers work with regional carriers like VHO? And what was the process like? Like uh, what did you have to do to lower your price at VHO, where, where it made sense economically? Yeah, so I guess to clarify, I was never offering $5 for middle mile because that'd be, that'd be outrageous. <laughs> um, no, th there was a – the parcel world and how things are priced is just different, right? It's just a different thing. And, like, I'm not touching how we price our last mile side of things. Like, that is that is a base rate that's going out in the same way that FedEx has their base rate, right? Yeah. And then all of their middle mile moves essentially is, like, goes by zone then for what, it, what incremental cost is being added on. Sure. Um, and there's all the surcharges and everything, which we don't do, which is, which is, I think a positive as well. But, um, understanding the structure of that, having worked with national carriers and regionals alike, um, I was at six e-commerce carriers at one point at home chef, mm -hmm. all priced and handled slightly differently than the mm -hmm. next. Right. Um, gave me a lot of insight into how that, like how things are structured and like, a ballpark of the price points that we need to be at, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you want to actually offer middle mile services and build a network out, it is an investment. I'm going to be smart about the level of volume that is like committed to these runs, ideally, right? Be mm -hmm. Before before we start running them, but like it is still an investment to get that volume in the door. Volume solves all problems. Like yeah. my in my world, 
more volume, more volume, more volume. I, I could care less about spillover here and there on certain days. More volume is king. Yeah. Um, especially if you can get it in like the later in the weekdays because the e-commerce world is always, you know, super heavy early week and then it kind of okay. trails, trails as the week goes on. Um, but in, in knowing that I had to price in that way to enable us to get that, uh, to get the, this, these boxes in the first place, to get the packages in the first place into our network. And frankly, like as you, as you start to shift and go after like the real large enterprise level clients and shippers, like what innate, like it, it's sort of this, it's somewhat of a compounding effect in that you're offering them pricing that is still an investment potentially depending on where you're at with a given lane or a given mm-hmm. region or whatever. But as I make more and more of these investments and these connections, I can now increase the size of the injections that I'm getting in the first place. So if I'm just doing middle mile from one point to one point, I can get two markets injected, right? Where it's being injected sure. and the one point. If I'm going to five points from there, I can now get six markets worth six areas worth of volume and now not like i can find and on top of that i can find optimization depending obviously geography comes into play here right but like there's potential optimization if certain stops are in line with each other or 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 what have you there i i have this ability to improve my unit economics on middle mile while we also just improve the company the, the volume that we're getting in general by making more of these middle mile connections and so Again, I'm not going to go down the whole path. It's kind of the secret sauce of like the methodology behind like coming up with all that and sort of like what we benchmark against and what we're striving to. Um, but what I will say it has enabled the type of growth that I outlined earlier, even like year to date. I mean, as as of this time last year, we were just doing a couple box truck runs to the small spokes in Colorado, and now we're you know six regions essentially operating. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's been a, it's been a cool thing to see grow. I'll say and. Um, and yeah, the, the, there was, I, I think it, it is ultimately like another thing that will set Vho apart in that way. Like the, the, the type of offering we give of, you know, new startup tailored to e-commerce customer mm-hmm. in mind tends to not come with the type of operational complexity and abilities of, oh, also we'll drop trailers at your shipper and we'll pick up as many loads as you need a day. And then we'll connect you to these eight markets. And here's the pricing for that. Like that, that is a another level that it, which is why I say like, to me, our competition is not the other last mile providers out there in the world who are coming up with new innovative ways to deliver. It's with the large regionals. It's with the nationals because like, that's the, that's the business I want. That's what I want to grow this into. I want, and it's not just me. I think, I think Vho in general, we don't want to be the even considered a regional because we're connecting anywhere in the country in this way. Um, okay. and, and I think, I think we can achieve it, but it's, uh, it's definitely a lot to build. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. But I, I think we have the right the right people, the right um, products in place to, to do so. How is this like the sales side of Eho? Like when you reach out to large shippers, mm-hmm. how are the conversations like? And uh, is it like usually like straightforward? And are they pretty open to working with you? I think it's hit or miss. Um, I kind of mentioned earlier, and I and I and I'm I'm cognizant of this, and yeah, I'm not like super involved in the, in the sales process in general, but like. It is absolutely not lost on me the the type of risk that any client or shipper is taking by disrupting their supply chain. Um, it is especially when you're talking to kind of these larger shippers, it, you're you're asking them to put a lot of faith in a startup's ability to service at the levels they're promising, mm-hmm. and to do the like the the type of operations that a national or or, or a regional can do. Um, and like I have full confidence in our ability to do so. But I, again, like you're, you're, you're asking for a bit of a leap of faith there. Um, I think as well, like we've just gotten smarter in how we go about those conversations and that all comes with time, right? Like you need to be able to have a understanding of how the industry works of the type of things that these large shippers are seeing from the nationals, from the regionals, the things will have to mirror because like their operation dictates it. Right. Sure. It's one thing you're going to, to some small shipper somewhere, we're picking up one load a day. We can live load or bring it back. It's a whole nother thing to go to some client who is, you know, two, 300 dock doors and you need X amount of trailers dropped on site as reserves. And, and there's a pull schedule involved. And that is where like the contractors that work directly with FedEx or the UPS mm-hmm. company drivers in their, in their trucks, making those pickups or even like the large regionals, like have years and years and years of experience. They have the assets, they have the ability to do that. And like, we are just stepping into that, but like we are achieving that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is it is certainly not an easy lift. 
um, and will become easier as we continue to grow over time. But um, I, I think in general, you know, you have to be able to instill confidence in in these in these shippers um, from an operational standpoint. What helps is, and you know, I'm certainly not the spokesperson or you know the salesperson that goes to do this, but like all of the the on-time performance, the customer experience stuff, and like how that all flows, the proactive nature in which VHO can allow a customer to change the address or mm-hmm. um, give directions in, in real time. I mean, I, we, when we walked into this building, right, that where we're recording, there's two big signs on the door, FedEx, do not leave packages here. These need to be brought to wh- wherever it was. Like that is a proactive update that is either tagged to this location and the dri- our driver partner has it on their phone that yeah. says you must deliver here or – Today I'm not I'm not around and I don't want my package to be stolen. Hey, please make sure that you are putting this on the side of the house today. And that message is going directly to that driver who is doing that again in real time, getting sure. that update. Um, those types of things are obviously huge selling points, right? Um, and then it's it's really instilling that confidence that we can handle the type of complexity that comes with these large these large shippers. And again, again, I I, I full I, I have full confidence that we can and we do for some already um and i hope that that just continues to grow totally and um i have one more question for you mark uh it's been a really interesting interview uh i was supposed to ask this prior to recording but i guess it's better late than never okay can you tell us a story for so that listeners could be intrigued by it about uh how customers um like let's say they come to you to viho how will the experience be different for them like what could be considered very different if they turn to VHO? so the end customer i mean a lot of it is kind of what i what yeah, i was just hitting on yeah, I, but totally. i mean that level of of you know getting a text letting you know your package from x shipper that you that you ordered from will be delivered tomorrow you get a text then the morning of we're gonna hit between this time and this time like to be able to get as granular as that is like we will be delivering between this time and this time you know, any changes that need to be made or whatever, you just reply directly to the text message to like put that in the, in, in a end consumer's hands, allow them that flexibility. Um, I think it's huge. And I know there's other platforms that are like trying to, to offer the same thing, but for us to be able to do that directly and then communicate those things directly to the driver in real time, that, that update for wherever that needs to go instead of their front door is, is happening yeah. right there. Um, I think is huge. On top of that, it's a new initiative at, at VHO that, um, frankly, is scaling pretty, pretty quickly. It's been pretty impressive, but we are now offering doorstep pickups as well okay. um, for returns. So whether that's you know the type of client where you're kind of keeping something for a short amount of time and needs to go back, or if it's just returns for a shirt that didn't fit you or whatever, we can incorporate those. Our driver partners can pick those up as well flow them kind of reverse logistics essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, to get them back all, like literally all of that can be done by the like the customer facing VHO app as well. Yeah. Um, which again, like just to make things easier in that way, it's not only something consumers love, but then the brands where they can really take advantage of that, that's a huge selling point, right? That, that we can start offering that, that we can guarantee the level of service that you would want to provide to your customer. Because end of the day, you are fulfilling an order you're putting it in the back of a truck that's picking up it's running through like all the communication is separate of you now like it's it's like now through the the tracking of whoever the the carrier is right to be able to incorporate things and like be able to report back directly to our clients of here's the here's the you know csat score we get because for every delivery we ask the the customer to rate it one to five um to be able to show that to be able to also escalate issues with the fulfillment that we get. We might get a bad review, but it says in the review, this is not what I ordered. And so it obviously like, not VHO, but like that gets flagged and we're able to see and like it's more feedback that is coming directly from their customer mm-hmm. that can go to them. And that I, I just think is is something that really sets VHO apart in that way. Right. So then again, to wrap it all up, like my goal is to achieve that same level of performance and getting it to, to that last mile in the first place. And that would ultimately is what will set us apart from any of the competitors that we're going against. So real quick question. Have you uh, thought about having those like pickup locations with like, with like where you just put in like your code, it's like Amazon pickup or have you thought about having that for VHO or no? There's been discussions, um, alternate ways to, to do launches, alternate ways to make deliveries. Um, 
I, I don't doubt for a second that we will be very creative in, in how we go about doing this as we continue to expand sure. and, and, and grow our volume and, and expand our footprint for sure. I, I picked uh, the reason why I mentioned that is because I, I live in Poland and in Poland there's this company called Impost, which just got bought out by I think a Dutch company recently and they literally set up a network which was just more sophisticated and quicker and better than like the, the Polish postal service. Mm -hmm. And they essentially just put like those pickup uh, and drop off, just, I don't know what they're called exactly, where you, it's like the drop, or you have like a little box that opens up yeah. and you put in your, I, you, you know the word for that? I forgot. We can call them drop box. Drop box. I, yeah. I know what you're talking about at least. And it's like essentially like almost for all of Poland, it's like one day shipping and mm -hmm. like one day, like uh, you, if you have like a, any like, uh, if you want to give anything back, just drop it in the box and it, Impulse picks it up, and it's like the easiest thing in the world. And I'm just shocked that like in America it hasn't really picked up. I know there's a few of them, but in Poland it's like everywhere. Like on every like every other block, you have like the the drop boxes and like so and the pickup box. So like it's for me it's kind of interesting how like in America they don't have that yet. Like it's, there must be some kind of reason for it. But that is interesting. Um, you know, I, I think as we evolve from being purely B to C, then like you know things like that could become a could become a possibility, and and you know kind of to, to everything I'm saying here, like could be easily incorporated into what we're already doing sure. just in reverse. Um, honestly, that side of things is, is pretty exciting to me. It's all, it's all very new for us and everything, yeah. but um, there, there's, I think there's a lot of possibility there. And like, ultimately, I mean, backhauls are king, right? If, if I'm, if I'm sending things backwards because they need to go there um, on runs I'm already making, it, it's just, it will only go to bolster that first and middle mile network that we're looking to build out. So it, it, it's totally. an exciting thing. Yeah, it's really that's really cool that you get the opportunity to to build this up. And I know you mentioned earlier that you left Home Chef because you saw the opportunity to to build something mm -hmm. again at uh, at Vho. So this is very exciting, uh, Mark. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's just say there's a there's a potential customer listening to this podcast uh, <laughs> and they want to set up a Vho. How should they reach out to you or someone from your team to get set up? That is a phenomenal question, and I wish I had the sales email on the top of my head right now, and I don't. Um, <laughs> but through our website, you can get you can get in touch. Um, and and uh, look, we're happy to field any and all opportunities right now because, um, again, I think we have something really really special that we can offer to to clients cool. and to their customers. Very cool. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Freight Caviar Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast or if you didn't, leave a review. Let me know what you think. I appreciate any feedback. If you'd like to have more Freight Caviar content, go to FreightCaviar.com and subscribe to my email newsletter.